Welcome to Architectural Series titled Architects Talk or Conversations with Architects, sponsored by Kalia Bodur. Today we have a very distinguished guest, Mr. Eric Owen Moss. He is a well-known architect, both in global scale and in Turkey as well. Uh, he is an award-winning architect. Uh, Mr. Moss, welcome to Turkey. Nice and to be here. And welcome to the series. Thank you I for want, having I want me. To thank you for your precious time being with us. I hope you will enjoy the <laughs> series. Uh, you are coming from states, but especially from California. Yes. Which is quite different. I mean, LA. <laughs> Because when we look from here, it is always associated with freedom and creativity. Yeah. It is one of the centers. I mean, maybe racing with New York or something like that. And uh, most of the architects, especially the young ones, think that it is a privilege to work in L.A. In turn, I, I mean, the architects coming from L.A. are working in privileged conditions, like yes. I mean, clients who are transparent to uh, <laughs> creativity. I mean, uh, yeah. uh, or I mean, uh, your limits to uh, for the project are always larger or flexible than the usual, etc. Is it true? I mean, is it the case? Los Angeles is a special city, but not necessarily for those reasons. If you, if you think philosophically about whether the place where you live or your work mm -hmm. most of the time determines who you are, it's one thing. If you think the people in the place determine what the work is. It's something else. So this is an old philosophical discussion. Does the environment determine the, con the content of the work? Or do the people who do the work determine the content of the work? And, and to be honest, I would say that there have been a few, a few unusual people in Los Angeles. And I would, I, my sense would be I would prefer to give credit to the individuals rather than the context in, in which they work. And those people have produced, I think, some special work in Los Angeles. Um, and there may also be a factor that has to do with the nature of the city itself. And the nature of the city itself in juxtaposition with a city like your city, like Istanbul, which has uh, history going back thousands of years, Los Angeles, if it has a history at all, it's 20 minutes. Yeah, you, and you were, you were defining it as infant, as far well, as I remember. You, you, you use the word infant, comparing with Istanbul or Beijing right. or something. Sure. It's a young, young city. city. It's yeah. a young city. So the, the Turkish architects who would like to work there should come there now, because I really think the future of Los Angeles is literally ahead of it, not behind it. And it's conceivable that a, a time would come when, you know, you don't have to make a project next to Rafael's Palazzo mm -hmm. in Los Angeles. There is no Rafael Palazzo. And therefore, the latitude to make different kinds of projects or the obligations to pay attention to what's behind you mm -hmm. is, not, is, is not substantial because there isn't a hell of a lot behind you anyway. Then. It's up to the architect, and then you get some differences, but you get some unusual work too. But you have to tackle with the problem of creating the context by yourself, maybe. I think I th that's an interesting way to put it, because there's no a priori mm -hmm. context that obligates you. Mm -hmm. Now, to be fair, there are all sorts of other kinds of pressures, not probably not so different than yours. But I think, relatively speaking, Los Angeles would be a freer place to work than most major cities in the world. I think that's true. But you, I, I again read somewhere that you said LA needed to stop worrying about emulating older, more traditional cities and embrace it is fragmented nature, its ability to serve as an architectural laboratory. So it, it is also a kind of a alternative ground, a, a further chance it should to, be. to try new things. It should be, and in the hands of a few people, I think it is. 
And I think that also sets a precedent for other people who are, who are coming now, mm -hmm. coming younger, younger architects. I think the point, <clears throat> the point that I was making in, in, in that situation was that there are inevitably people who look around a little bit nervous, a little bit unsure, a little bit uncertain, and they see examples, Ringstrasse, Champs-Élysées, mm -hmm. Rambla, Tiananmen Square, whatever it is, pieces of urbanity from historic cities that are famous, and they say, okay, we have to have one of those. We have to have our Champs-Élysées or something like that. And there have been, for instance, Wilshire Boulevard in Los Angeles, I yes. think, has, there, there's a notion that it belongs to a kind of urban road yep. where there are precedents around the world. So I think there are also pressures from people who want Los Angeles mm -hmm. to grow up, mm -hmm. to grow up in a way that resembles other models in the world. I think this is difficult physiologically because of what Los Angeles is. Politically, there may be some constituency for that. So I think Los Angeles would be better, would be healthier if it acknowledged its opportunity to make things new mm -hmm. and focused on that. I mean, to make a train through Los Angeles now is like a 19th century. It's not like Shanghai, Beijing train. It's a very slow train and, and follows a traditional train route, which was abandoned 50 years ago or something. So there are, there are pressures to, to resemble models or precedents in other cities, which I think are, are not good pressures to respond to, but they exist in Los Angeles too. Yes. But on the other hand, I mean, uh, architecture in states in general, yeah. uh, and of course LA, had a significant dominance in mainstream architecture. And yeah. as, an, as a student, when I was in university, we were educated with references to Frank Lloyd Wright, Flip Johnson, yeah. and many things that came from the new continent, I mean, as the modern architecture. And, right. and they were sometimes more dominant than, in terms of uh, defining the contemporaneous, a sense of contemporaneous, they were more dominant than what we observe, what we see in our environment. So it is a kind of a, I mean, uh, yes, there was no history or a kind of a background, but I mean, there was a significant dominance in terms of, especially in modern architecture, coming from uh, well, well, I, I think cr creating the heroes, for example. Yeah, I, I, right. There was a capacity of continuously creating heroes, and it's a continuous case, I think. I think, I think America has a predilection in architecture for making heroes. Mm -hmm. I, think, I think we can, we can do that. And you raise a, a very interesting point, particularly in the world today. Mm -hmm. I like the point, but maybe it's less an architecture discussion, more broadly a social and political yeah, discussion. What's America? Mm -hmm. What's America? And uh, the architects you mentioned, uh, Wright belongs to a really probably to the 19th century, not even to the 20th century. Philip is another story and conflating those two is a little bit, is a little bit complicated because I think that for me, they mean very, their work mean, means very different things. But I think um, Wright is an original American, a 19th true, yeah. century American. And, and the 19th century for America as a symbol to the world, to Europe and to, to Asia and to many places, as an opportunity which was a remarkable opportunity that you could do things and make things and behave in a way that you probably couldn't do anywhere else in the world. Um, I, I don't think that's entirely gone, but I think the perception of America in the world is, is somewhat different. Now, America in the world is not quite the same as American architecture in the world, which is not quite the same as Los Angeles architecture in America and the world. What, what I would say is, as an ideal, I think Los Angeles does have an opportunity in terms of heroes in architecture 
and making architecture new that was once a venue for America entirely. Mm -hmm. So I think Los Angeles has, has done that and continues to do that. And I think that's an important role that Los Angeles, Los Angeles architecture can play. It's funny because I never thought of myself as an advocate for America, per se, or an advocate for Los Angeles, per se, or Los Angeles architecture. I'm probably an advocate for certain ideas or certain ways of thinking uh -huh. and occasionally certain people. Because I would say my collection of a few friends, maybe five, six colleagues around the world, is is a kind of is a kind of metaphorical Los Angeles, and and even though the people aren't always in Los Angeles, might be pricks in Vienna, uh, might be Stephen Hall in New York, might be Tom Main in in L.A. You know, a few of us who get together and then mm -hmm. go away and don't see each other for six months, even though we 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 talk. So that's my my redefinition of mm -hmm. what Los Angeles architecture could be. I, I wanted to say one other thing. Philip Johnson, um, and, and have, to, have to say, was, was very... He used a definition for you, like uh, yeah. Jivulov yeah. Junker. <laughs> Do you remember that? Yeah, I, with the first book we did with Rizzoli, mm -hmm. He wrote the he wrote the introduction and, and he made he was very friendly and very uh -huh. supportive and 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 uh, we always appreciated his because in architecture you're trying to do things and you look for friends and sometimes everybody is making faces and he was he was he was helpful but he did something which I think is is a, back to your question about about yeah. Los Angeles as an original versus Los Angeles as being obligated to models that belong, let's say, to Europe. Mm -hmm. We don't know what to do. Let's do something like that. <clears throat> and Hitchcock and Johnson made a very well known exhibition, mm -hmm. Museum of Modern Art, in, mm -hmm. in, in, in 1929, bringing European conceptual ideas could be de style, could be constructivism, could be the Bauhaus guys, could be the futurist guys, bringing it to, to America. But, so this is already in a certain way a kind of definition of an inferiority complex. Mm -hmm. Do your own work, let Santalia do his work, let Eric Mendelssohn do his work, let the Athens Charter guys, we'll do our work. I think Los Angeles is a little bit like that in a way, not obligating itself to, to conceptual, to intellectual, to theoretical models. Oh, they know how to do it? Let's do it like they did it. Over the Atlantic Ocean, into the Museum of Modern Art, now everybody everybody discusses this, and and uh, in in a sense it made it made America at an intellectual level I think sympathetic to and I don't know if the word is inferior but we should do that that's where the new ideas are coming from from Europe so in a certain sense modernism in America was imported from Europe, but they stripped away, for instance, the constructivist had an ideological premise, a philosophical, a historical premise, futurist, so on and so on, Bauhaus too. It became a style in America. Mm -hmm. So whatever true. political ideologies and associations, which are quite fascinating, you know, so Moses Ginsburg working in Russia, or Le Corbusier borrowing from Moses Ginsburg, by the time it by the time it wound wound up as a house in America, all the ideology was dropped in the Atlantic Ocean, mm -hmm. and it became a series of images. So this is interesting, you know, whether the images what images belong to what politics is a discussion, but when America imports, America America leaves behind the social and political context out of which these movements in the early 20th century originated. That's what Johnson did. He made it a style. Can, can we say that I mean, there's a breaking point in 70s or 80s in terms of, I mean, uh, what, what we are witnessing is a more uh, American style of 
doing things and uh, less pressure of European architecture in that terms I and mean, in, in that stylistic manner. Well, I mean, if, if, if we come back to your philosophical uh, definition of America, I mean, I, I always like the uh, Jean Baudelaire's uh, definition of America where he says, I mean, Americans created uh, Las Vegas because they wanted all the people to believe what is rest is real. <laughs> uh, I mean, we can we can replace maybe LA and Hollywood with uh, again Las Vegas. I don't know. So there is a significant transparency to virtual reality and freedom in that sense, which which can be read as creativity on one hand, but virtual reality on the other. Well, my my opinion about. <coughs> I don't think I have a popular opinion about virtual reality or I'm, I'm not sure what reality is in a philosophical sense, never mind in a personal sense. So I'm not sure how whatever that is becomes any more or less intelligible if it's virtual. As far as Las Vegas, as far as Las Vegas goes, I mean, without, without uh, uh, sounding too saintly, I don't want to sound particularly saintly, it was never a place that I admired. It's a pastiche of, you know, whether it's mm -hmm. the Eiffel Tower or the Doge's Palace mm -hmm. or whatever, whatever they make. And there, <coughs> there's something about working in architecture, and you know this. It's a Not, frozen form of Hollywood, I think. Um, it's, it's, yeah, but... but um, there are films that are Kurosawa is a filmmaker, That's Bellini true. is a filmmaker. I mean, Hollywood movies, however powerful is their constituency, is not the only content <clears throat> in America. And there are people who, who, who look at that and who are disappointed in can, it. Can it be compared to architecture, I mean, in a similar way? I mean. Um, As you compare I think the, Fellini with Hollywood, for example. I think, I think the best architecture, I don't know about the film, music, architecture, literature, you know, that equation is, is, is for a more complicated or a different discussion. But I think the best architecture might be kinetic. It might move you. So even though it physiologically is static, but in an emotive sense, it moves you around. In that sense, which is a jump, it may have some relationship to film. And there are a lot of discussions now. We use this mm -hmm. too about the relationship of making animations mm -hmm. in your office That's and true. using animations, not in an illustrative way, not to show the client That's what it true, means yeah. to, but in a conceptual way, using animations as a as part a of... As a methodology of design. <clears throat> that's right. Mm -hmm. And, and I, think, I think as a tool, it, now we have to see, does it really make something which, which innovates or changes the context of a discussion? So some of the tools, and maybe this is where, where you're going, some of the tools that, that, that filmmakers use or Hollywood uses are also led intelligible tools to make architecture now. So even though the, the, the medium, the result is different, but the, the, the tools that are being applied may be similar. And this is also interesting because not so long ago they were, they were considered quite different. Um, so this, this might be a step. We have to see what, uh, what all the talk leads to. But maybe this, this sort of kinetic sense of buildings from different, in other words, you don't understand it by standing here looking at the Arc de Triomphe or something like that. That the, that, that the interrelationship between the constituency for architecture and the architecture by moving it, you see it here, you see it here, you see it here, you see it here, and you begin to understand in a composite way, not in a kind of elevational way, you know what I mean? It's this, drawing perspectives and things like that. So a more complicated way of seeing and thinking might give a different kind of building typology. In that sense, filmmaking and architecture may have a relationship. Yes, that, I, I, I think that's very significant. Uh, and it, uh, in a way, I was just going to ask at the end of today, I mean, 
if if we can talk about an LA architecture, maybe this is the this this movement and uh, mm. I mean the the this flexibility and which is ending up uh, with non typological uh, arrangements or design uh, can be the uh, shared ground because when I look at uh, Tom Mines and uh, Frank Gehry's uh, architecture there are significant uh, continuities with what you are doing in terms of I mean forms etc but what what I read when I look at your architecture it, it is unique and different than the others in the way that they are not stylistic but rather research based uh, which is open to end up with different styles, if you, if you call it style, I don't know, uh, or as you have defined uh, differences, let me define it like that. So in each project, I mean, it's not easy to uh, estimate how, how it will end up. I don't know if... Right, I, that's I, right. I, that, that's an interesting point. <clears throat> this would be a much better discussion if we were walking around a building mm. and looking at it and yes, talking about it. It's, it's a little bit more difficult speaking to an audience in a, in, in a very uh, abstract way. But one point I think you're making, and I would say this is, this is true of me, there are, there are architects and good architects whose work you recognize in a certain sense. That's true. And, and my it's guess, very easy to say which building is a that's Frank right. Gehry building. And the client, example. Frank a little, the, the, the <laughs> client comes and says, okay, give me one of these. I saw that's this true. in Barcelona. Yeah. I'd like to have one of these. Mm -hmm. And the architect says, okay, mm -hmm. we, give you, we, we give you one of those. When they I, come to <clears> you, they are confused, what I'm trying to underline. Uh, well, I think, I think the ideal from my point of view, would be, and I think you said this, to start down the road without knowing exactly where the you destination are, is. Not only that, going down the road without knowing the route, okay? So when you and Suha and I are driving from the hotel, we could go this way, we could go this way, we could go this way. Not only that, maybe we'll have the event over here, over here, over here, like that. And I remember I used to drive to my office, and every day I tried to go a different way, uh -huh. you know, just for fun. And in the end, you know what happened? <laughs> I said the same way again. So this is always the pressure to, to come back to a routine and to something that's more efficient or more recognizable or you can expedite more readily. But what we, what we make an effort to do is to discover what we want to make in the process of working on it. That, mean, that doesn't mean there aren't initial ideas and concepts and strategies, but that the capability that, that you have in an intellectual way to turn your mind inside out and to work in a way that doesn't guarantee that everybody knows at the end, when you start, what the conclusion will be. Yeah. So we would, so I think if this is your point, I think this, this would yeah, be great, I, I, but it's I, hard to do it. I know that, I mean, because I, what I was trying to underline is that the process is as valuable or more valuable than the end product, at least at the beginning. I mean, once you obtain Let me say the end, end product, maybe it, it becomes... Let me say something about be a, the... Pro because I think you, I heard you say something which is, which is very valuable. Look, if somebody says, what is the objective? This prize, this commission, this book, this magazine, this dinner, this whatever it is. If, if you look at things that way, who acknowledged you? And it's not that, 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 that people, you and I included, don't appreciate those kinds of acknowledgement. But in the day-to-day -day living of your life and working, what really counts, I think you're saying this, is the process with your team, with your colleagues, with your pals, of working through these. It's like an adventure. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. That's how you live your life, like an adventure, if you can, mm -hmm. okay? It makes a lot of 
pains in the neck. It That's makes true, problems. Yeah. You have people chasing you and complaining and so on. But there's, there's an enormous satisfaction out of, out of what is genuinely a process of interrogation, investigation, invention, discovery, whatever you want to call it. That's really where the life of an architect, or from my point of view, my own life, gets its meaning. That's true. And vice versa, on the other way, I mean, uh, depending upon a stylistic production, is a reductionist uh, way of handling things, I mean. Yeah. The end product is, uh, has a kind of a guarantee at the beginning, maybe, or I mean, it, it always sells in the market, but I mean, you may not have that pleasure and research. And it, it, it also, uh, I mean, op it creates an obstacle to be innovative in that sense, uh, to be open to research and new uh, I think, advantage, I, think that, I think that's Just. right, and I think, I think with certain clients, particularly large clients who mm -hmm. tend to be a little bit more conservative for all the obvious reasons, and, and a bank comes to you, so we're making a, a very unusual high-rise building yeah. in Los Angeles now. The floors are different, it has no columns, it has no beams, it can't, it can't go through the building department because the codes that apply on, uh, based on which it has it, to be checked. It was checked. twin towers and it was reduced N to now, one, now one it's, single now, tower. Now, it, now it's yeah, one I, I and know, now we're starting to, to build it in April. Uh -huh. And this is, we've been working on this for off and on for, for, uh, for a number of years. But the banks... Mm -hmm. And the owners, and the owner is great. The owner is a man and a wife. They're fantastic people. But when it's a lot, so it's, it's the, the project is, the project is a large project and it's, it's an expensive project. And when you put that kind of investment into the project, you want to know what's coming back. That's true, yeah. Maybe. So the pressure as projects get bigger, to guarantee, if I come to you and I say, oh, will you make this for me? I want to make sure that what you're making for me is something that is plausible, workable, and I can pay for it. And I would like to know that when we start, not hope that That's we right. get that at the end. But there's a range of possibilities. Some clients are very conservative. Some clients are a little more open. Some clients are interested in the content because of the content. Some clients are interested in the content because they think the content is brandable, marketable, saleable. So there are a lot of different motives and a lot of different, different perspectives. And for us, we have to find people, and now we start to find people. Um, it took us a long time. And, and I understand why. And, uh, uh, but we find people who have some sympathies that we can share and work together to, to, to solve the problems, moving a little bit into unknown territory when we can. Uh, actually, I mean, sustainability of a research-based project or getting into such adventures are deeply... Uh, depending upon the scale of the project, as far as I understand. As the project becomes larger, I mean, the expectation of the client uh, becomes more sensitive, maybe, let me use the word. And uh, so, I mean, staying as a kind of a boutique office or a small office, uh, staying away from uh, becoming institutional, a very big office, for example, is, is creating a kind of an alternative ground or a freedom to, to uh, make research sustainable in architecture. Is it, is it the case? I, I think that, that first I would say, and I think most... You, you don't have a big... And no, we've never had more than 30 people. Yeah, that's... We've never had more than 30 people. We have, I don't know, probably 22, 23 people now. And it will sometimes work if we work with the mm. Chinese, we mm. work with a design institute, so on and so on. Um, I could imagine that it would be a little bit larger. 
but I don't think it's ever been, it needs to be this size and this size only. It seems to have gotten to a point where we can do what we need to do with the people we have. We'll see what happens next. It's, it's looking like it might have to, to enlarge, so we'll see. But I do think there is, there's something about the personal relationships to projects and project content that would probably be difficult if the office had 600 people. That would be a different kind of office because then you're formatting, you're systematizing, you're methodologic, uh, your, 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 mm -hmm. your organizational strategy and your form language has to be organized and I hand it to you and I hand it to you and I hand it to you. Like that. Process is no more a main issue. Then. It's it's not it it's, it's not as no. as inventive and as personal and as free. But one thing I would say the 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 issue of large projects or small projects wouldn't necessarily be an issue of quality. That's so that there and I think this is a lot of the interesting projects in the 20th century and even into the 21st have either been smaller, have been houses in some mm -hmm. cases, and, and, and so on. So um, content is content. And the politics, the logistics, the money, the pressures are different in different cases. And maybe the pressures are, are a little bit more substantial with larger projects. Mm -hmm. Because from the client's point of view or the bank's point of view, there's more at stake. But I mean, if you're doing a project which is 10, 15, 20 million versus a project which is 200 million, I think it's certainly possible to do something remarkable at the smaller scale. I think it's mm -hmm. important to understand, especially for young architects who are doing smaller projects, not necessarily to assume that you have to, that you can remake the world's vision of architecture only by doing a new city, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. you know, that the smaller projects also are substantial, could be. That's true, but, but um, um, is, is, is there always a representative relation between the uh, city and the architecture of the city? Uh, because in LA, for example, what, what, what you, you were saying in, in one of your writings or interview, that uh, LA does not represent the architecture of LA or vice versa. A am I wrong I or something like that? Well, <clears throat> you know, this, this is like Kurosawa's film Rashomon where different people could uh -huh. answer plausibly in, <laughs> in, in different ways. So, okay. Uh, but, but I would separate Los Angeles as a generic proposition with Hollywood, with the movies, with all of that from a few architects who have done unusual work. I would also say that the unusual work in Los Angeles <coughs> probably to some degree is facilitated by the lack of a history hmm. in the city, the lack of a durable history, and even <coughs> more so the lack of density in the city. So Los Angeles is like this, you know, it just keeps mm -hmm. going. And now it's doing this, mm -hmm. actually. It's starting to fill in, and there's a lot of space to change, to change density and so on. So I would like to separate every original piece of architecture from every city in which it originates mm -hmm. and, and to deal with, with the physiology and the content of the architect and the architecture without the city. Now, if you go and look at Bernini in Rome or something, mm -hmm. So the equation is, is, is quite different than Moss in L.A. You know, sometimes you're the outsider, mm -hmm. sometimes you're the insider, but what's, what's crucial is to, is to maintain your own conceptual independence, either as an outsider as a, or as an insider. What happens in China? When you yeah. go to China? You know, Xi Jinping gave a speech, maybe you guys saw this, the last week or 10 days, he gave a speech and he said, all no of this, more. Yeah. no more funny business. No more, yeah, I, I, I remember <laughs> You know, architects who, who can't do these mm. things now mm. are coming to China, China to do funny, funny things. Yeah, not, it, and, no more <clears throat> experimental things. That's right. And uh, it didn't 
appear that he was looking at that work as experience. Dubai is still like that. Yeah, Dubai. They, they Dubai is, is still a venue for that. <laughs> so this is again the, the, the politicians arguing for a more conservative, historic-based way of seeing architecture and cities and people and so on. So the fact that Xi Jinping would, doesn't distinguish him from, from lots of other uh, leaders mm -hmm. in lots of other countries, because I think there is always, you guys have the same thing, yeah, America has the same thing, Russia, France, England, Italy, whatever it is, Japan, whoever I left out. And, and, and uh, what we have to do is make sure that, that we have to understand that, we listen to it, and then we have to make sure that doesn't apply to us, that we don't that we don't want the tendency to homogenize architecture, to make it predictable, to make it related to a state history or precedents. We know those pressures exist. We just have to resist them. And and I think in China, I mean, the the day of coming into China and and for Western architects and and inventing buildings, I think that day might be coming to an end. But you you have ongoing projects. In we China. have we have two. One yeah, in a city projects. called Kunming and another in in Shenzhen. Nanjing. Yeah, not Shenzhen. Nanjing. 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 I, I didn't know that. Yeah. Uh, and uh, I mean, are you feel yourself in the, in the same way that, that for example, you are uh, designing in uh, LA, or I mean, are there? Well, the opportunities are different. What we're what we're working on in Nanjing is actually a city. Mm -hmm. In fact, it's four cities tied together. <laughs> and and it, Xi Jinping is right in one sense that that there aren't too many places in the world that you and I know where those opportunities are available to come into a swamp. <laughs> Here's a swamp. You mentioned Shenzhen. I mean, Shenzhen in the 1980s had, what, 15,000, 20,000 people true, living yeah. here? It was a fishing village or something yeah, like that. True. And now look Within at 40, it. Within 14 years, they yeah. became... Yeah, so, yeah. So the, the capacity of the Chinese... Um, we were working for a while. It's on hold. We may do it again in a place called Weihai which is about an hour west of Seoul uh, in the southern area in China on the coast. And they're, they're rebuilding the whole coastline. They're mm -hmm. trying to make it a sort of Bahamas, Hawaii, you know, that, that kind of, well, we don't have one of those. Let's <laughs> make one of those. It's a little bit like Las Vegas. That's true. In yeah. a way. No, I was Let's, just about to come to that point. <laughs> yeah, no, it's, it make a dream. And you go there. They asked us to make a tower, like an icon for the Weihai, uh, which really has, it has a restaurant, has a little museum, but it's just a big thing flying in the air. And, and I, I think it, it's, it's an interesting commission, but to, to look at it in a hard-headed way, it also, it also makes the discussion more superficial. The pressures on an architect, site conditions, budget conditions, the prosaic things, not mm. the philosophical things, also have a lot to do with the content of work. In a certain sense, somebody says, go do something, which really <laughs> has nothing in it. Make an adventure. I think, I think adventures probably improve with the intensity of the adventure. And the intensity has something to do with very different kinds of, of, of threats to what you want to do mm. or pressures on what you want to do. And I think in that particular project, there are relatively, relatively few pressures, which makes it interesting. It's, kind of, it's up to you. It's the fantasy of what's presented about architecture in Los Angeles. Oh, you can go and do anything and everybody will say, fine, you know. Mm. I'm not sure that's the, that's the strongest context in which to operate. I mean, some of the most unusual work is, is done under really excruciating limitations. And that, too, there's a, there's a kind of art form in working around that. In the end, nobody asks what was the pressure, what was the client. I mean, they may ask if it's your girlfriend or your friend or something like that. In the end, the building is the building. 
whatever made it what it what it is and we can sit here and talk there it is uh -huh. you know i go away you go away everybody goes away new people come there's the building so the building the story of the building in the end is the building what is the limits of contextuality i mean uh, is it as you said it's not so power the context is not so powerful but still well, I think uh, I'm, I, I'm not referring to a kind of a artificial sense of nationality or something like that, but right. the geographical climate and especially cultural references. I mean, this is this is an interesting and a, and a very important question, and for all the discussion about globalization. That's true. I'm not referring to a Chinese culture, but a kind of a production culture, new. Uh, commodities, I mean, how things are produced, yeah. delivered, and uh, commodified uh, in the new world. I mean, China is representing such kind of a, a relation uh, pattern right. more than anything else, even more right. than its uh, her own uh, I mean, culture. I, I, I'm sorry again, we're not in Los Angeles. We're, we're finishing a building now that's called the Pterodactyl. If you, if you look at it, it's, 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 it comes out of the top of a garage. Yeah, I, I, I've seen it's, that. It's, I, if you, I, I, if you see it, and, and the building that, even with Katia, mm -hmm. we had, with, with the, the best software, we had some mm -hmm. interesting technical problems. And when I listen to what you say about, about fabrication and new tools, with all of that, it's still been a very tough go. But I think yesterday the client actually moved in. So we did it. It's, it's, it's great. But I think, I think the, the context question, the idea of how the context influences the discussion is, is very different in very different hands. I mean, there are people who will explain and justify architecture based on the view is here, the door is here, the wind is here. Uh, the highway is there, acoustics, right? Diagram, and, diagram, right, so. operationally, and nobody, and, and those are more what I would call, not banal, but prosaic kinds of questions, but they're questions. So the, the, the issue for, for me would be those answers are part of the story, but they're never an adequate explanation for the content of a project. And not and the essential question. It's, it's really not. So it has more to do with how those concerns or issues are integrated in a, in a broader kind of dialectic. I mean, I would call it a dialectic because I'm interested in oppositions in a project. I'm not so interested in a homogenized rendition of this is the world. I'm more interested in representing something It might be this and it might be that. But these are words. Mm -hmm. And then the, somehow the, the, the poetry of the experience could be homogenized, even though a poem might have antithetical components in it. So I think the, you can't make a building that's an observatory to look at Mars and Jupiter and Sirius if you can't see what you're looking for. That's right. So, you know, if we couldn't get up the elevator to do this discussion, so we'd have to do it on the sidewalk, which might be better. Um, so operationally, those components in a building need to be done intelligently. They need to be done efficiently. But if they're just a replication of that solution to those problems that exist in a million other situations, then you haven't moved the discussion in a way that you could see it differently and understand it differently. It reminds me, there's a stair in a, in a dormitory that Jim Sterling did in Oxford. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and I remember going, this is Oxford, so it's a six, 700 years mm -hmm. old university, mm -hmm. and Christopher Wren and all these characters, quadrangles. And he makes a quadrangle. It's a stair. It's an exit stair. That's all it is. Everybody has exit stairs, so the fire department won't give you a building permit. And it winds around on itself, and it, and it leans out, and you look down <laughs> into the river. 
it's really a remarkable, it's just, it's a vignette, an experience. I mean, hell, you could knock the whole building down and just keep the exit stair, and it would be fascinating. So what I'm saying is every piece, it's a prosaic piece. It's an exit stair. And yet it was never dealt with. And guess what? It allows you to exit. That's true. But, and and it will, you put one foot in it and you yeah. get there. But it has, in a way, everything to do with that. And in another way, nothing to do with that. And this is what I'm talking about. This would, this would be a way of solving what it is and producing what it isn't in the process of doing what you need to do to make it what it needs to be. That's true, but that what ne it needs to be is, uh, I think, is, um, uh, differs with respect to the context and the project and the scale. For example, talk, coming back to the garage project that has been recently completed in LA, it, it, it gives me the feeling uh, that it is a more geometrical, an artistic base trial to, I mean, express a kind of a, a tectonic expression, uh, the, the most dominant part of the project, rather than, I mean, philosophical and social issues, etc., etc. Uh, so, I mean, it is a kind of a, uh, like, like it's, it's, it's a more artistic expression. But when you come back to China, you are talking with the realities and the facts and everything where the reference point is quite different. Uh, well, so, the, so the process differs, I think. While you are working on the garage project, I mean, you are referring to the uh, computer program Katya and its possibilities, mm. the geometries, how to cut the forms, and uh, yeah. etc. Uh, in building scale, the other one is a kind of a uh, urban fabric which controls all the relations right. and well, redefines the, them. The scales, the, the scales of the two are quite different. But you know, it's, it's, it's useful to me to listen to your description. And when you come to LA, we walk through the, <clears throat> the pterodactyl, that it's artistic or that it's geometric or that it's a technical expression somehow of capacity. And I think all of those things, all of those ways of explaining it are, are valid, have an aspect of validity. When you look at it overall as, as a thing, yeah. as a series of shapes uh. in a space, in a particular grouping of buildings, I, th I think, it, to me, it has, it has a slightly different meaning of, of an effort to reconcile obstacles or differences that don't quite get reconciled and do. It's, 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 it is both contradictory and unified. And I think that's an experience with me in, in, in my own life, which in different ways some people might share or put it in different, in, in different words, that nothing ever quite fits. Mm -hmm. Nothing ever quite works. And, and you, you invent ways tentatively or temporarily of knitting your life together that's and right. giving it a kind of story. That's this right. is my story. But when we talk about it somehow, the, it's not that your life has a story apart from you. So what's interesting is the relationship of the story and the storyteller. That's you true, know? Yeah. Now there are people who think, well, there are facts mm -hmm. somehow, or there is a narrative. But I'm inter I don't think that's, that's true. So this is my narrative, and you would have your narrative. And I think the obstacles to homogeneity are real. Now, there's a different argument. I remember a few years ago having a debate with a guy who runs an American school called Yale. And I was talking about some of these things, and he said to me, <clears throat> his you name is teaching. Stern, and he, and he said to me, okay, why should architecture, I, I understand what you're saying, why should architecture be about that? <laughs> why should it be? 
why shouldn't it be everybody is smiling and holding hands and kissing goodnight and the sun is coming up and going down? Make everybody happy. <laughs> so I make everybody happy. And, and I guess in the end, those differences are because maybe this is what makes me happy. But, but trying to, to find in architecture and working with people and for people and, and with my guys a way of, of developing temporarily a facsimile for a human experience, uh -huh. not only literally the experience of the project, but the experiences of the lives of people who make the project, who sneak their lives into the project because the client doesn't know, in a way. And you don't tell the client. In this sense, the accidentality of the end product is, uh, I mean, the end product is open to become accidental, maybe, but, in a way. Right, but you know what's also funny? I remember we were making, a, a years ago, a, a kind of, a, canopy of bent glass mm -hmm. you know and and everybody said you can't draw it you can't bid it you can't fabricate it it'll break it'll fall down it'll leak and they'll sue you mm -hmm. you know and guess what happened every one of those things we were building it originally for the los angeles philharmonic uh in in Los Angeles and 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 we built it and and to me it was an example of of working through new technical issues in related in relationship to conceptual issues and and here's the point and I think this is important to me when things are done the time that they're done is, is for me important in terms of a discussion uh -huh, uh -huh. of architecture. You, if I did that project today, there's a guy in Shenzhen, there's a guy in Barcelona, there's a guy in Mexico City who can all make that glass. Mm. They can make it right now. When we made the glass, you no couldn't way. make the glass. We had to figure out. So the vision of the project as an idea and the, and, the, to, and the technical implementation of that idea, you have to be able to figure out both of those mm -hmm. in a way. And, and that you don't get to just say, this is an invention. Eric Mendelssohn is making drawings in the trenches of Verdun, you know, in the First World War. These mm -hmm. little drawings, they're beautiful little drawings. And then he goes to Potsdam and Einstein Tower and takes a bunch of mud and bricks and <laughs> kind of throws that. They didn't know. How, that, that's really what interests me, that trying to figure out how to make something like that when you don't know how to make it. So it's both an idea, an idea in a conceptual way, and an idea in terms of understanding the technologies or inventing the technologies, moving the technologies. I think both of those are essential at a particular time. That's really where new architecture comes from, both of those. That's right. Uh, you are coming quite Frequent to Turkey. I, 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 I like last, here. last month you were here. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> it's it's nice to see you here. So I don't know whether you had a chance to walk around and see Istanbul, mm. uh, but uh, how do you find the contemporary architecture in Turkey? You, you First of all, I have to. Some I, architects. You yeah, have I, I, I have uh, Suha. I mean, I, to be honest, what I know of of Istanbul and this part of the world comes from <laughs> our friend Suha yes. Khan, and I have to. I have to. Uh, who is uh, listening uh, us who is now? <laughs> a pretty there. sophisticated guy, even though he claims not to be, about architecture and lots of lots of other things, and and he took me to. Uh, an architect's office uh, a few weeks ago to, to meet one of his friends. And what, what interested me was, was the design of a project, which I understand is a controversial project, uh, because we had a brief discussion of, of the architecture of mosques, mm -hmm. you know? Mm -hmm. So this architect made a mosque. It was below grade. It, it did things. It made moves. Yeah. That, that you would, if you saw it and somebody said, this is a house for a client or something, 
So it's not that the it, originality comes in a lot of different forms. And, and it, it wasn't so much what we saw was unprecedented as a strategy for making buildings in an abstract sense, but to apply it to this kind of building mm -hmm. and to build it, it got built, okay? Mm -hmm. So this is the other thing we yeah, didn't say. Idea, technology, get it built. Mm -hmm. This is, so the guy got it built. <laughs> so this was, this was great. I think for, for me, this, this was because it started to show a kind of, a kind of potentially maybe the dam cracks and there are a lot of ways you can see this in the history of cultures including religious buildings you know that mm -hmm. in in the Christian world or the or the Jewish world or the Buddhist world or the Hindu that, that, that those kinds of building typologies in a sense signify how stratified or rigid is the culture overall and as they start to evolve, maybe this is also a sign that the culture itself is more interpretive, more open, more flexible. I thought this was one of the most interesting things because you don't hear about that in, 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 in this culture so much that, that certain ideas have, have a kind of sanctity and they're frozen. And I think the other thing which is obvious to everybody here is the cistern, the Roman cistern. And I think Sua took me there a few years ago, and it's a completely fascinating place. And for me, I still use it in lectures, you know, the Medusa sideways, the Medusa mm -hmm. upside down. And, and to me, this was, <laughs> I really like this. In a sense, this is the Romans attacking the Greeks, <laughs> using the Greek repertoire, putting it upside down. You're out, we're in, you believe this. You thought this is the capital of a column in your temple? No, it's not anymore. <laughs> now, it's, now it's the base for a water system. We have the power, and I yeah. think this is, this is a great way for architecture to move, not little by little, but, you know, it's great, this cistern. Everybody should see it. It's fantastic. But when you walk around the streets, what do you see in Istanbul? In terms of contemporary architecture, of course, not the history and the uh, cultural richness. I, th I think it would it would be presumptive of me to uh, Istanbul is a remarkable city. Okay, I, I don't think maybe Barcelona, maybe there, it's a very special Asia to Europe, Europe to Asia. Mm -hmm. All this is every, everybody says, and leaving a piece of its history. So for, for me, coming from a place like LA, this is completely the opposite of any way of thinking about the world. If you're in Los Angeles, you're working in Los Angeles, you don't really give a damn. And there's nothing to give a damn about. So working in a, in a world next to Sinan, mm -hmm. okay? There's nobody like Sinan anywhere. It's a guy, I don't know how many projects he had, 500, like what, huh, you know, and, and uh, so there's, there's, there has to be a kind of historiography or a kind of, it's not only this way. Mm -hmm. In different places, it could be in a respectful way, not in a copying way, also this way. So there are pressures in Istanbul. Then there's the physiology of the city. The only city I can think of that's anything like it in is San Francisco mm -hmm. in terms of bridges and water. Yeah. But San Francisco is, is, is doesn't do what Istanbul does. It doesn't have the history. It doesn't have Hagia Sophia. It doesn't have cisterns. It doesn't. Have, it doesn't have. It doesn't have the Romans and 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 the Suleimans and all of these guys running around for hundreds hundreds of years. It, it really is, is a kind of urban essence of a city that holds its history and cares about its history and wants somehow, doesn't quite know how, to make a new history. Mm -hmm. I think it it's a, might be one of the greatest places to work. It's not like China, which is, here's a bean field, go make me a city. Mm -hmm. You know, it's not like LA, which is, very horizontal and a lot of room for it. There, there are pressures of history and also and, and, and pulling backward. So to push forward 
in a place like Istanbul would be really remarkable. I don't, I don't know that anybody has quite succeeded in doing that yet, but I think there's some architects, some architects who are trying to do that. And, and I think that context has to be respected also. Mm-hmm. And working here wouldn't be just a matter of, this is always a discussion. You know, you come into a city, you come into Barcelona, you come into Vienna, you come into Shanghai, and you do whatever you do and you go away and it kind of doesn't matter. Uh, you do what you do. This is me, I do it here, and it's, it's the same everywhere, but mm-hmm. everywhere is different. To actually work in a city like this, um, with its history would be a very special opportunity for, for an architect from, from outside, I think. And, 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 and to see how, the, how, the, uh, uh, how you could move the weight of the history. You know, it's like the Sisyphus story, pushing the stone. So the architect who works in Istanbul has a big stone to push, true, yeah. you know? Different than L.A. You, you have to start in a different yeah. Position inevitably. Yeah. I think so. Uh, what about the mainstream architecture? I mean, uh, the, the, there is an ongoing. Uh, I mean, within the age of media, the, the repetitive promotion of images and architects and star architects brings a sense of contemporaneous, which is uh, kind of different than what 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 we yeah. used to have actually, which which is. Uh, updated very shortly and I mean it is uh, so there there is a kind of a mainstream architecture but it's not easy to read it uh, on the other hand uh, but I mean everywhere all around the world we, we see the similar uh, buildings and uh, so this this is a discussion of of the changed role of the presentation of architecture as a function of digital media and I think it, there are a number of, of consequences to that, one, one of which is that architecture books, mm-hmm. books are fewer and fewer. And I know we worked for a number of years with Rizzoli. Mm-hmm. We still work with them. But the pressures, I was in Rizzoli in New York the other day and I looked in the lobby waiting mm-hmm. for a friend of mine to go out to lunch. And there wasn't a single architecture book in the library, you know, mm. in, in the whole area where they exhibit what. Yeah. I mean, they had things like Diane Keaton, who is an actress, uh-huh. Uh-huh. remodeling buildings in, in Los Angeles. So one of, the, one of the issues is that if you value books, whether books are old fashioned or not, so this is, we could talk about that. Um, there is always a fear that you're not, in general, you're not contemporary enough, you know. But so this is not my fear. But anyway, it, it, it certainly has had a consequence to publishing and talking about, about uh, books in, in a written form. Um, the other thing that I think has happened is that, 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 the, that the availability of of work on the internet has turned it into a more a more glib superficial styles That's true. you know and that a kind of deeper reading of mm. of the content of architecture um i have a little boy and a little girl not so little now but but the boy is you know uh, always with 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 the phone and I was reading a book to him the other day. It's a new book. I don't remember the author. It's called The Shallows. Shallows, not mm-hmm. very deep. And it's a discussion, positive and negative, of the strengths of, of digital communication and various mm-hmm. kinds of software. And also what it does to your mind, you know, as opposed to focusing, jumping from one thing to another. So we're talking all of a sudden beep text, beep text. And the question is, are we here or do we belong to what's coming in? Mm-hmm. Do we belong to what we are, or do, you, do we belong to what's coming in? And I think that, that whole, and by the way, I have to say that the people who are educating the younger people, the older people, were not people who grew up with this. So in a certain true, sense, yeah. the younger people know things and feel things and are learning things that we don't know either. 
Because this is always, this is a kind, of, a kind of difficulty with older people making speeches to younger people about how it should be. But the two worlds are, are a little bit different. So I think, yes, the, the visibility of architecture is much greater, much more readily accessible, much more a topic of general discourse, not only kind of special in schools of architecture and architecture magazines, which are more and more disappearing. That's true. Uh, but, but I also think in, in terms that, that we would probably share uh, a, a closer reading a, a deeper examination of some of the issues. Why this and not that? What does this mean? This is what it is. What could it have been? What should it have been? You know, a, a, a more probing discussion, analysis, uh, examination of what's being produced in cities and buildings and so mm -hmm. on. It seems to me that that's going away and that you have all kinds of blogs and characters. I mean, I know stuff that comes in to, to my office and about my office because there are people who look at that in the office and we have, we have Twitter and we have Facebook. And, and, and although, when I look at those things and I'm trying to understand what they mean, a Facebook for me seems to be a way of developing one's own you know, image of oneself. I have to get the right picture of me mm -hmm. or something like that. So somebody will think I'm something I'm not. You know, I, I'm a fat guy, but I should look like a skinny guy or <laughs> something. You know, all, all of, but, but really, I think a lot, of, a lot of the idea of image as uh -huh. opposed to what is making the image What's the, what's the, why, it's not so much this is red and this is green or this is round and this is square, uh, but, but what those differences mean. And I, I think this is just the way it is. There are not too many Herbert Mouchamps mm -hmm. or Lewis Mumfords cruising around talking now about, about those kind of issues. Everybody, I know they have something in L.A., called Curbed LA, which is somewhere between architecture, real estate, fashion, media, you know, so every time you do something, so they write some comment. The person who's writing about it may have borrowed half of what they wrote That's from true. three other blogs that they never acknowledged. They may know relatively little about it, but somebody says this matters, you better get something down, otherwise you're lost because you're not ahead of everybody else. They have it, they have it, they have it, you better, or you better say something, you know, all of that. So the it's world- It's representation of actually contemporary yeah. media, yes. Yeah, and, and, and one thing, and I can see it with the kids, somehow you, it's not only, a, you don't need to know anything in a way, you just go on Google and you, oh, uh -huh. Suleiman, oh, Roman cistern, you look it up, you write it down, you turn in a paper, and you forget about it. Mm -hmm. So what, what's missing, I think, is the ability of, of someone who looks at that material to distinguish between what's good or what's intelligent or what's not so good and why. In other words, some ability, even if all of that material is out there and available and entertaining or interesting or what everybody thinks it is, it's not what it says it is. It's something else. Mm -hmm. And you have to be able to, one has to be able to negotiate it by bringing an outside opinion to the material. Critical distance. Yeah. And I think the, the educational system now and the way people are learning and using the tools, you can say, okay, Google is fantastic. It's really fantastic. I mean, I can, I was, I was trying to give a, um, a little key, a piece of jewelry to my daughter um, just before I left LA. And I was looking for a quote you know, a quote from Charles Dickens or something. I couldn't remember. You know, I couldn't remember it. You know, so I put in put in the Charles Dickens key quote or something, and it came it came back to me. A little key opens a big door. You know, 
no way in hell would I ever, I couldn't do it. Mm -hmm. So, and then I wrote it down and put it with, I gave her a little key, put it mm -hmm. in a box, and <laughs> I'm going to give it to her. And so this is, this is great. So this is not a matter of saying it's neither good nor is it bad intrinsically, but I think it's very important what we bring to it in a critical way. So when you read Curb L.A. or something, you can tell it's junk mm -hmm. and why, you know? So when you see something good, you can recognize it. When you see something that's inadequate, you know that. But what happens to your architectural education then? Because, I'm, because you are yeah. on, on one side, you are also a kind of a... Uh, you, you are directly inside the academy yeah. and you are yeah. teaching and you have yeah. lots of students and uh, you, you, you are uh, a significant name in terms of architectural education as well. Uh, so, I mean, what will happen? Uh, uh, what is the current version? Well, of you and I, yeah, you and I can't control everything that will happen, but you and I can influence a direction in particular places mm. in a particular time. And what I what I do in in as an involvement in education is very different than what I do in my office. In this sense, that, oh, we, that was something I was going to ask. Actually, is is there a continuity between what we do in it's the a good, it, it, it is a good. It is a good question because there are schools run by architects. At least in some cases, I mean, the quintessential example would be the Bauhaus, mm -hmm. which was an ideological, an aesthetic, a technical, a social perspective, and it was imposed on the students. You want to be a radical architect, you want to do the next thing or take the next step, mm -hmm. do this, do this, do this, do this, do this. It's like a checklist of, of what to do and how to learn if you want to be a certain kind of architect. And you have a role model who That's does right. it in the proper way. That's exactly right. You have a role model who precedes you mm -hmm. and you see, you follow the, the, the example uh -huh. and you'll get to where you want to get. And my perspective is, in a certain sense, there aren't any role models that you should follow, but there are probably some that you should listen to, but you should listen to in a critical way, mm -hmm. which means not only what they put in, yes or no, but what they left out, yes or no, so that what, what the, the goal would be to create a, a mind, an inquisitive mind, which would have enough self-confidence both to appreciate what preceded it and to criticize it and move it in a different place. And if you can create that kind of mind in the part of a student, and it doesn't always work, well, how do you do that? First of all, you, you say what I just said. You talk about it in that way. You give the student a sense that, that their job is to do the next job, not to follow the last job. And then you bring people in from around the world, talking, exhibiting, lecturing, teaching, mm -hmm. debating, making books, exhibitions, classes, um, uh, events in architecture the same way in, in a few weeks we bring Suha to LA. Does it have a risk to turn into a curb? Well, <laughs> um, yeah, I, I, I mean, I, we're probably giving those, it's a little blog, I, we're really probably giving them too much credit. <laughs> but I, I think when, when if, you, if you come to, to, to speak in that environment, I think you know the kind of environment you're coming to, to speak in. It's also an environment that's very used to, to seeing and hearing from people in architecture who are in one way or another making contributions. And so I think the audience is, is a little more sophisticated. And the audience is also, I would say, a confident audience. I don't think it's a superficial audience, although looking at different kinds mm -hmm. of, I mean, it, it's, it may be, some of what you just said is true in the sense that people could take things mm -hmm. and simply reproduce them. Make their own collage. Yeah, mm -hmm. and, and that happens. 
But it's not encouraged to do that. I think it's encouraged, encouraged to look, to think, to evaluate, to say what works and to say what doesn't. And coming back to education, what do you suggest? Well, I think what I, what I said, I think, I think what, what, what we want to do is, is give a student the sense that, that, that ideas move, history moves, mm -hmm. and in a certain sense you have, as we all do, in different ways, an opportunity to write history. There's, there's a line, we, re, we write history and history becomes the history we write. Not history is something over there by somebody That's else, right. yeah. but history is here and now and it's us uh -huh. if we can do it. So that the, the, the capacity or the will to move the discussion forward it won't be every student. Maybe the 500 people in the lecture, maybe three will do it. That's true. You know? but, but that it's available as a way of thinking as opposed to you have to think about architecture in terms of what somebody else thought about architecture. And this is not to denigrate necessarily what somebody else thought. It's just to say that every idea was incomplete, inadequate, and gets to be remodeled whether it's Copernicus or Galileo or Darwin or Newton or whoever it is. They don't get to stand up forever and say this is the way it is. It's never like that. Sometimes it moves a little and sometimes it moves a lot. I think we as, as people tend, oh, Freud said it, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Jung said it. So for a long time this was a model. What happened to that? So these, so these things move, and you can move it. I think that would be the idea. That uncertainty and, uh, I mean, continuous research is, yeah. is an alternative opportunity. I right. Think. Thank you very much for being with us. Uh, I think uh, we are uh, just around the time. Would you like to add anything else? Uh, just that uh, I want to thank you for the opportunity to, to, to speak to an audience in, in uh, Istanbul and, and in Turkey. It's a really remarkable world um, for me. I wouldn't claim in any way to understand it, but I'm fascinated by it. And, and uh, more Americans should, should come to understand that and, and, and appreciate it and learn from it and also find a way to... to to be in that discussion. It's an important place and what you're doing in these discussions I think is helpful in that direction. So thank you very much. We thank you. I mean it was really a pleasure to be with you within this series. I'm going to give the link. <laughs> thank you. Thank you very much. <clears throat>